Welcome to the Journal of the Southwest radio podcast, a production of the University of Arizona Southwest Center in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. I'm Jeff Bannister. I'm talking today with Dr. Maribel Alvarez, the Jim Griffith Chair in Public Folklore in the University of Arizona Southwest Center, Associate Dean of Community Engagement in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and an Associate Research Professor in the School of Anthropology. Dr. Alvarez also founded the Southwest Folklife Alliance, a nonprofit organization that supports folk life throughout the U.S. Southwest and Northern Mexico. And on top of all that, she is the director of Tucson Meet Yourself, one of the largest folk life festivals in the United States, which was started in 1974 by folklorist Jim Griffith and his wife, Loma Griffith. As a public folklorist and a professor, Maribel straddles a line between the life of a scholar and that of a community leader and advocate for regional folk traditions. It is, as she has written, a balance between intellectual inquiry and public impact. She is also a student of human social organizations and is skilled in the art and science of building them. In 2018, Alvarez was honored by the American Folklore Society with the highly prestigious Américo Paredes Prize, which is awarded for excellence in integrating scholarship and engagement with the people and communities that one studies. I spoke with Maribel about the history of Tucson Meet Yourself and about her role as both a scholar and promoter of regional folk life. Well, Maribel Alvarez, uh, welcome to JSW Radio. It's so great to have you. Wow, what a pleasure to be here with you today, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're most welcome. So uh, today is the first day of October. Um, and here in October, uh, autumn is definitely in the air. And, you know, we can open our windows up at night and uh, let in the coolness of the evening. Um, and we've had a beautiful monsoon summer. <laughs> Uh, and just one week from today, we have Tucson Meet Yourself, um, one of the largest uh, folk festivals, I think, uh, in the United States. And you are among many other hats that you wear, uh, the program director for Tucson Meet Yourself. So I'm hoping that you could tell us a little bit about that folk festival and, and your role in it. Absolutely. Wow. It's um, 48 years in a row, beginning in 1974, that uh, the first to so meet yourself took place and 48 years here we are. Of course, the event was conceived in the, in the mind and hearts of Jim and Loma Griffith. Uh, the seventies were an interesting time in, in Tucson. It was an interesting time in the nations. We were approaching the celebration of 1976, which was an outpouring of interest in history and culture and heritage in this country. Jim and Loma, uh, had fallen in love with the borderlands. Jim had finished shortly before that, a few years before his doctoral work in anthropology here at the University of Arizona and kind of couldn't peel himself away from Sonora, Sinaloa, the, the, the native traditions, the Mayos, the Yaquis, the desert. And so they remain and the idea came up of a festival. You know, Jim didn't like the word festival because at the time, uh, Jeff, in, in that 19, early 1970s, late 1960s, the folk revival uh, in music had sort of taken over. And there were a lot of college festivals with singer songwriters, you know, mm -hmm. that were under the label folk. Jim saw himself a little bit different from that movement more in the tradition of the anthropological folk life approach that looked at the entire life of a community. Mm -hmm. It's cooking, it's dancing, it's rituals, it's belief system, it's language. So he chose folk life as the banner for um, the new event that he named with a, with a funny name that had at the beginning a coma, Tucson coma, meet yourself. <laughs> and here we are today with, you know, almost uh, five decades later. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so uh, tell us a little bit about um, why has it been so successful in Tucson? What is it about Tucson and, you know, the, the festival situation in Southern Arizona that, uh, that brings in so many people? You know, in the library at the uh, special collections um, archives, there there's the Southwest uh, folklore uh, collection and 
There are photos there of the first or second to some meet yourself, black and white photos. You see a lot of bell buttons. <laughs> Uh, you see a lot of Afros. You see indigenous people huddles with blankets. It used to be cold in October mm -hmm. <laughs> in Tucson. Was, it was really literally uh, the, the, the kind of passing ritual of the summer that had been so unforgiving. Mm -hmm. And you see this mixture of ethnicities and cultures. You see, you see this represented in the photographs. And you see them huddling together under the dome of the old county courthouse and, and Jim animating and explaining what music they were going to hear, what dancers were going to perform, how that dance belong and made sense in the context of that cultural enclave, but had not been seen by others. So what, what we begin to see is what a folklorist out of Indiana once called how a festival like to some meet yourself, began to change the metabolism of cultural diversity in Tucson, right? Mm -hmm. It affects how people begin to step out of these sort of private moments. And, it, and they do so in the civic center of town. I joke sometimes and tell Jim that he was the leader of the first Occupy movement in Tucson. <laughs> <laughs> because these folks had not had their day in the sun in the civic life mm -hmm. of the city. And the festival all of a sudden brings to, to the dome, to the center of government, the site is occupied by these minoritized communities uh, in, their, in their ethnicities. In one of the early, I think it's 1975, there's a column that appears in the, Tucson Citizen newspaper at the time. And the headline of the column is Ethnics on Parade. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but that, that was how we thought about, about American identity in the 1970s, you know, in, in binary polarized ways or in, in sort of monolithic ways. So I think Tucson Meet Yourself, and this is the, the greatest gift from, from Jim, begins to change the metabolism of how in this desert town, this sort of rising emerging mid-sized city from the old west, you, you detect something is happening that has to do with culture and, and beauty and respect. And, um, you know, it goes through many changes to some meet yourself by the time it gets to be 30 is sort of highly contested. Not everybody believed that people will go downtown. Why would this guy mm -hmm. continue to make this festival in a, in a sort of blighted neighborhood and that mm -hmm. many Tucsonans consider even dangerous through the, through the late 70s and 80s? So there's, there are moments of, of debate about Tucson Meet Yourself, it's multicultural embrace, its production value, its association with the university, this this researcher this scholar he wants to control what it is it should be more celebratory and less educational you hear mm -hmm. all of these things happen in the lifetime and yet all throughout it persisted with a very faithful core group of uh what we call in our field tradition bearers mm -hmm. those whose, whose job is to carry on a sense of identity and heritage so that's a long answer to your beautiful question. <laughs> oh, that's such an interesting answer to the question. I mean, I feel like, I mean, there are so many ways to um, understand that space of Tucson Meet Yourself, which is down by, uh, uh, what, down in the old courthouse by the City Hall, um, which was the old Hispanic urban core of Tucson that was removed, basically, uh, in right. processes of urban removal in the, um, what would I guess, the 60s. Um, and the part of the the thrust behind that removal was, you know, a kind of a dominant understanding of that area as blighted, as you just said. So I can I can just imagine the kind of tension that would um, that would swirl around it. And then, you know, fast forward to 2021, and we're we're you know, a lot of these debates are still going on, but they have different cloaks, uh, right. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying nothing has changed, but I feel like, you know, now it's sort of like, you know, critical race theory is at the fore and, <laughs> you know, all of these things. And yet here is this festival that has this through line 
for almost 50 years, you know, and here you have taken up the mantle and you and your team. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the present day context a little bit mm. more and, and tell us about what it's like to organize and be at the head of this. <laughs> yes. You know, when I, when I first came to, to Tucson and joined the, the Southwest Center as the um, Jim Griffith public folklorist. Was that um, in th- uh, early 2000s? 2000? Yeah, that was 2000. Oh. I came in 2003, did a fellowship uh, that year. And then in 2004, I uh, was formally uh, offered the, the position. Mm-hmm. I thought there was nothing that I could do as a folklorist to add <laughs> to <laughs> the body of work that Jim had uplifted. To so meet yourself, I had been a cultural producer in a gallery setting, curatorial sense, but to so meet yourself scared me. <laughs> it was an event that consumed hours and hours of preparation and planning. It had a, a, a widely, vastly horizontal sort of structure where people of all walks of life, of all backgrounds, educational levels, had a stake in it, in a in a real sense of ownership. So it wasn't something where I could say, hello, I'm the new Jim Griffith and I'm coming to tell you what to do. It was mm-hmm. quite the opposite. People were telling me what to do and it, it scared me. And I thought there's there's not much I can do here. In, in some strange way, the, the, the recession of 2008, nine uh, shakes the foundation of arts of the arts infrastructure everywhere. And here in Tucson, what it does is it removes the city support for the production of Tucson Meet Yourself. The city used to not charge for the, the booth that they provided, uh, the bleachers, the police coverage, uh, electricity was all provided in kind by the city of Tucson. Mm-hmm. And all of that is removing the recession. And a decision has to be made at that time of whether really that was the end of Tucson Meet Yourself because the festival was not raising donations from sponsors or nobody on staff was getting paid. It was all volunteers. So it depended on that type of back uh, support from the city. And at that time, uh, a woman in town named Mia Hansen, who had been involved with the Cultural Exchange Council, who had been part of the Up With People movement, which had mm-hmm. sort of introduced Tucson to a lot of cultural diversity in its in its own form and variation. Mm-hmm. Mia Hansen stepped forward and said, we can do this, we can do it better, we can do it larger. And in a lot of ways, she is responsible for, she's the bridge between the, the old Tucson Meet Yourself, the small, I would use this word in quotations, folksy gathering of, you know, the what I call the the followers of Jesus, <laughs> mm-hmm. the downtrodden, the invisible, the the minoritized community. From that sort of small trusting event, she launches it into a large organization with its own production values, with its own sort of expanded footprint. Invites, and she asked me to become part of that mm-hmm. uh, in my role as the university folklorist. And, you know, I have to say that that's where I saw the window of opportunity for me to contribute because I'm an organizational person. I am an assistance person. And I thought, okay, well, now I can I can partner here to to bring something. And and the journey then began that takes us to this new form that people know today of to submit yourself as a sort of elevated and large operation that takes the legacy of all those 48 years, but really in the last, I would say 13 or so years has um, presented a different type of offering, a different type of broadening of the work educationally, artistically, and certainly symbolic in educational in the sense of the civic fabric of of Tucson and Pima County. So it's an interesting um, evolution and one that took a lot of learning, and I'm forever grateful for that <laughs> crisis, if you will, mm-hmm. because it gave Tucson Meet Yourself the opportunity to reinvent itself. Mm-hmm. Wow, I can imagine how, I can only imagine how intimidating it would be to step into Big Jim's shoes and 
try to um, keep this thing going, that this, this event that brings so many different people, so many different voices and so much diversity. Well, um, and, and Jeff, I have to say that in my relationship of as a mentor, as a teacher, uh, as a dearly beloved friend of mine, Jim showed nothing but generosity to mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. And what he had that was, that had endured all of the ups and downs of Tucson Meet Yourself through the 80s and 90s and mm-hmm. um, scales and, and people in and out. What had endured was the authentic relationships he had forged with ethnic native communities. Mm-hmm. His relationship with the Yaquis was, was as deep as a well. <laughs> mm-hmm. they, they were in the first Tucson Meet Yourself representing the deer dance ceremony as as part of a program he curated that he called sacred music he had uh, african-american gospel singers there uh, that day he had um the yakis then began to perform the deer dance and the pascolas as the only occasion outside of a ceremonial tribal setting Mm -hmm. where they would stage quote unquote this blessing for the public well by the time i come in Four decades later, that relationship with the Yaquis remained as strong and authentic, as beautiful and ever. And Jim was the holder of, of the fire that. And you know what? He passed all of those contacts to me. He introduced me to folks. He would go with me to visit uh, some of the home cooks in their homes. And my goodness, I cannot tell you what generosity of spirit he, he showed in sharing the wealth that he had, which was really the wealth of relationships and trust and credibility. I don't think without his blessing and that type of forward action, I would have been able to continue the job, frankly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Marty Bell, I, I'm sure I, um, I'm sure Jim would concur that you have done an amazing job uh, of keeping all of this going. And I know it's a team effort. Um, but I really want to um, to recognize that you you know you really stepped up to keep this festival going, and you know, and, and in so many ways, I feel like you are the perfect person for this job. Just mm-hmm. your 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 generosity and your incredible curiosity in the way that you are with people. I, I was I'm kind of wondering. So you know, in and I might be a little bit biased because you know you're my friend and my colleague. <laughs> I, I wonder about how uh, the structure of the event has changed over over time. So you're saying early on, you know, you had Big Jim up on stage, kind of introducing different um, groups that were performing, um, and then helping people sort of understand and situate them, give a little history and background, which seems so crucial. Um, how is that still remain in place, or how is it happening now? No, I'm so glad you asked that question because as much as, uh, and thank you, by the way, for the kind words. What Jim and I then discovered was that we were very different type of folklorists. Mm-hmm. Jim, Jim liked to get in the kitchen and just, you know, pound the meat and, you know, be there with a measuring cup of the ingredients of, of the of the folkloristic aspect. He's, he's a storyteller. He's a consummate uh, detail seeker of like, why is that nuance of that particular recipe or that song different? So he's that kind of folklorist. Mm-hmm. I was more of a institution building, organizational system type of folklorist. So I became it became possible for me to then engage curators and and to hand over to them. And I'm the program director that oversees the general theme, but then to some meet yourself began to develop a specialized offering each year. So we have a a folk arts section that depends deeply on relationship with the Tohon Autumn Nation Education Department and Museum with the Pascuayaki Language and Education I've handed that over to Leah Moss, who is the curator of folk arts for Tuso Meet Yourself, but she also serves as the uh, executive director of the Southwest Folk Life Alliance. So she holds those relationships uh, mm-hmm. in, in her fold. We have a director of performance, an ethnomusicologist uh, now from University of Arizona in the Honors College, Dr. Kate Alexander, and she now holds the relationship with the performers and the schedule. Uh, and every year there's a special theme. For example, this year, when we're still dealing with COVID, 
uh, we are creating a loss and remembrance tent, a ritual, meditative, uh, contemplative space. And Kimi Isel, beloved dancer, cultural writer, journalist, and now as Southwest Folklife Alliance folklorist, mm-hmm. she is curating that tent. We have death doulas sitting with people through grief. She has curated a special Korean, Armenian, Native American song traditions that have to do with the cycles of death and grief. And she has a, a plant person who's going to talk about herbs and aromas and medicine in relationship to the, the suffering of others. In other words, I have nothing to do with that depth of curatorial offering. Uh, I am trusting Kimi as the curator of that tent to then produce that sort of uh, value mm-hmm. in the educational offerings, in the experiential sensory uh, opportunity that is to so meet yourself where you, you get to see, hear, touch, uh, experience things. And that is a, a stylistic difference between me and Jim, but it's mm-hmm. also uh, what has in some ways mark and distinguish the the more modern version of Tuso Meet Yourself. And I'm I'm referring to the Tuso Meet Yourself that begins around 2010 or thereabouts. Yeah, so, um, well, nonetheless... You know, I've read some of your work and, uh, you know, we've definitely engaged a lot as, as friends and colleagues over the years. And uh, I can see that you too have quite an eye for the details. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely also see that you, um, you have a very institutional kind of inclination, um, you know, organizational institutional inclination here, but I do also see that you, um, you know, you have a deep appreciation for the, you know, the, the beauty and, and the details of, of folklore. Um, one, one, well, thank you. And I'm a curator myself. In fact, a few years ago, uh, as early as I think 2011 or 12, we began to stage uh, exhibits at Tucson Meet Yourself, full-fledged outdoor exhibits that last three days. And at first it was like, whoa, what, how do you do that? How do you treat the art? Well, Jeff, I cannot tell you that that's one of my proudest accomplishment if you have ever been to one we started with one uh, that we I work with Gary Nabhan of the Southwest Center uh, it was called uh, my ranching life and it was a feature of ranch traditions mm-hmm. in it, it was beautiful <laughs> we just simply transform a large uh, canopy a, a vinyl tent into a museum like experience mm. uh, of highest quality storytelling artifact display with context and and then we went on and did others in in the 100 year anniversary of the uh, school of anthropology we staged a, an exhibit that i curated about called 100 years of anthropology in the community and we told six stories about research that had taken place at the University of Arizona School of Anthropology that had incredible impact in the community, including the garbage project, Mm -hmm. which happened here in Tucson and led to the creation of the recycling program at the city of Tucson. Mm -hmm. Um, We talked about the forensics lab that the Southwest Center also has. Now, Robin Reinecke, we work with the medical examiner and stage an entire recreation of what it would look like to identify sort of remains and testimony. Uh, we work with Jane Hill and her legacy of what she called junk Spanish and the, the ways in which code switching happens in the Southwest here in Tucson. And then we featured a section about Los Tucsonenses. Of course, Tom Sheridan's um, community-based work, and we told that story. Well, let me tell you, that weekend, from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we had over 6,000 people come by the exhibit. And we know the numbers because we had U of A students, (laughs) anthropology students, English students, be the, the ushers in the exhibit, count all the people and also be the interpreters mm-hmm. uh, s- s- engaging with the public. Well, that was amazing. And we continue to do that uh, in, in stunning exhibitions that are temporary pop-ups. So I'm, 
I brought that <laughs> and mm-hmm. I, I mentioned it because it's, it's one of my, my unique uh, personal uh, favorites. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I think uh, maybe, you know, people don't always see, or it's not immediately, not always immediately, um, you know, understood how deeply rooted in this community, the university of Arizona can be. And I think in particular in programs like anthropology, um, you know, with its focus on culture and people, um, or even, you know, the Southwest Center, you know, we have several units that are just very much, uh, you know, woven into the fabric of this, of this community. Well, and, and you know, the, the Southwest Center is the, the, where the Jim Griffith Endowment for Public Folklore sits, is where, is my academic unit on campus. Uh, it's where, where we have sort of David Yedman, um, Gary Nabhan, Tom Sheridan, Jim has a sort of affiliation with the center. There, there's a lot of work that the Southwest Center has done behind the scenes to be the institutional home of support, certainly for my work, but for much more than that. In, and that's one of the interesting things about this field of, of folk life that the festival is the culmination. It's just a visible event. But in fact, the work that undergirds all of that, it's much more spread. And it even happens in people who will never call themselves a folklorist. I'm thinking of David Yedman. I don't think I've ever heard him even remotely come close to the label folklorist. Yet the work of documentation he does, the depth of care of how he tells stories from people in our region, of their engagement with plants, with the landscape, with uh, certain traditions is certainly part of the cloth of folk life Mm -hmm. more broadly represented in the work of the Southwest Center. Mm -hmm. And I do have to acknowledge that uh, Joe Wilder was someone who brought a lot of us together under the that banner. I, I speak of canopies at Tuso Meet Yourself, mm-hmm. where Joe Wilder invited me, welcomed me, and gave a lot of us uh, a space under the canopy of the Southwest Center to be able to do that work. You know, in, in some surprising ways, Jeff, and, and you, you carry on this legacy w- with a certain grace and quiet humility, you know, mm-hmm. and that's, that's also been very important for me to be able to do the work that I do. Well, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. That's a, I, I actually want to, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your, um, your, well, you have your other hats um, as an anthropologist, um, as a, uh, an associate dean for outreach. But I actually have one more question about Tucson uh, Meet Yourself that you brought up earlier, which is, so you have this, you know, you have this pivot in 2009, 2010 with the great, the so-called Great Recession, um, but now we're in year two of COVID, um, and you know this this virus is is transforming um, a lot in the world. Mm-hmm. The, the very ways that we relate to one another, and how has how have you had to pivot in this time? And and do you think that some of the ways that you've had to pivot are going to keep you know sort of ramifying going forward with uh, with Tucson Meet Yourself? Well. Uh... Thank you for that question. Um, in 2020, we we produce uh, largely a, a, a virtual festival. Every day in October, we had an activity. We had 46 online productions that month. It's beautiful. It took a lot of know-how that we didn't know on the technical aspects of recording, making those things accessible. We we're able to get through some socially distanced events of a different scale. For example, we created in 2023 pop-up Tucson Eat Yourself, where we had a, a very small number of food vendors preparing food and it was only for takeout and they did very well. And we use um, the resources of community sites where we could stage those pop-ups very effectively. We had uh, we work with the Dukes Car Club to organize a, a formal lowrider cruise because we were taking advantage of people being in the cars mm-hmm. as opposed to you know a social gathering of a concert or something like that. So, oh my God, Jeff, we did it, and it was amazing, <laughs> and we pulled it off. And all of those recordings of all those 46 sessions, by the way, are can be found in access at the TucsonMeetYourself.org site if 
people are curious. We have incredible talks, conversations, performances. Okay, and then I thought, well, that's that. We don't have to ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> we plan a, a return to normal. We call we call the 2020 festival Reframed, and we call the 2021 festival Reconnect. And this was, of course, May, where we were very hopeful, uh, as we were, all were, that once the vaccine was introduced, we would be back to normal. And then, of course, Delta variant came, and yet we were working so closely now with the county health department mm. that we decided that, and they gave us the okay to proceed with an outdoors event, but we had to set the gold standard for what that would be like. And one of those things was, well, let's reduce the density of the, of the event. You, it gets too packed on Saturday night. You can hardly move. Mm. What if we reduce the way in which the layout is organized? So, that there's less possibility and more opportunity for social distances. Uh, What if we actually had markings on front of the stage where people can understand what a three by three square is and separate themselves from others in huddle in their three by three uh, squares? Okay, we'll do that. (laughs) What if we introduce a a vaccination clinic and now booster clinic inside the, the festival itself? Okay, let's do that. (laughs) And went on and on through eventually coming up with a 15 point mitigation plan for how to do an outdoors event safely, which is what we are about to do next week. What did it change? It it taught us something about density (laughs) Mm -hmm. in a way that we had not quite considered. It may be that the size of this do some meet yourself next week it's exactly the sweet spot, you know, instead of mm-hmm. three stages, we have two. And guess what? We were able to accommodate all, an incredible number of performers. Um, probably could extend some things that the Duke's Car Club are not going to have 70 cars, low rider cars in show. They only have the five or six classic Chevrolets from the Duke's Club. Some demonstrations, people can learn how to pinstripe their cars and things like that. You know, Jeff, it it may be that a week from today or a later, I may be telling you that the downscaling was, was better and it's where we need to be. And then we added an event at the Fox Theater the Thursday night before, mm-hmm. an indoor event with dance, 11 dance companies in a stage show launching the first Arizona Ethnic and Traditional Dance Festival. Wow. It may it may be, Jeff, that we discover that doing some events pre to some meet yourself is a winning proposition as well. So you catch me in completely learning mode. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. And I actually that kind of all that sort of leads me to one final question. Uh, I didn't think I had, but. Um, Tucson, Tucson, meet yourself, uh, known colloquially, uh, oftentimes as Tucson, eat yourself, as you alluded <laughs> to earlier. Uh, you know, the the food component is a huge dimension of all of this. So how um, how are you handling all of that in the midst of um, of this, or, or how do you keep people, you know, socially distanced? You know, it's, it's funny. It's that's probably one of the easiest ways mm-hmm. that we have because because the health department is so intricately connected with the food vending at Tucson Meet Yourself. Uh, Very few people know that there's an entire set of rules that vendors have to follow for organizing and that a health department inspector comes to each booth and the booth is not allowed to open until they get the clearance and the paperwork from the health inspector. So Mm -hmm. in some ways that food vending has always been the more, um, accessible form of um, safety control that we've always had. So Mm -hmm. pretty, pretty comfortable with that. The gathering of large crowds in front of the, the, of the booth when they're ordering food and then they form a a long line and you can't get through. And then you have to cut across people uh, that are strangers to you. Well, we are not able to demand and require that everyone wears a mask because it's a public open space and the Mm -hmm. city of Tucson regulation for mask mandate applies to indoor spaces. Mm -hmm. 
but we're highly encouraging that. We'll have masks everywhere. We'll suggest to folks who wear them to wear them. We'll have sanitizer. So there are some um, stanchions also that will be located in front of the food booths so that people can form a, a line that is not this long sort of crowded spaces, but a more organized, keep your distance type of lines, like when you're in a bank or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we are thinking of every angle that, that we can think of. We've also indicated in the map this year, for example, there are three spaces that we have traffic control for pickup food only. We know from the World Health Organization that you can leverage being outdoors. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can leverage also the control of how much time you spend in a public space uh, as to your degree of exposure. So the longer you are there, the, the, the more exposure you get logically. So we're saying to some folks, look, if you feel a little bit vulnerable, but you still want to come and support some of the food vendors, and boy, we have an incredible array. And this year we have... Even in the middle of a pandemic, we have a new vendor from Nepal. Mm. <laughs> so well, there'll be Nepali food for the first time into some meet yourself. Um, even if you need to come, th there will be three areas designated where you can park your car, go get your food and then go home. You don't have to park in one of the garages. So we're, we're going all really? out to facilitate access while keeping safety in, in mind. Mm -hmm. oh, good to know. Well, that's good for, I think, for those who listen to this before they go to Tucson. Uh, meet yourself. <laughs> it sounds like you've taken a lot of, there's a lot of planning that's gone into all this. Uh, <laughs> and, and in conjunction with Pima County too. Huh? Absolutely. They're, they are incredible partners. I, I want to pivot here toward uh, folklore and your work in that area more specifically. Um, of course, you know, connected to the festival, but but also the the many other things that you do, um, both within the institutional setting of the university and outside of it in the in the broader community. But I think it would be good for our listeners to know <laughs> how many different hats you wear <laughs> here at the university. So, and please let me know if I miss something. <laughs> No, Jeff, you know, I, I, I think the, the, the most exciting part that we've already talked about. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, well. I, I mean, I'm happy to tell you just a little bit that um, I still have a role in, in relationship to the Southwest Folklife Alliance that I, I founded and, and were able to get uh, with the help of J.P. Jones, the dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Science, we were able to enter into a formal legal uh, affiliation agreement with the university that uh, is authorized by the president of the university. And the Southwest Folklife Alliance uh, works across the entire border corridor in the state of Arizona. It could be in Hopi tomorrow. It could be working in Phoenix with the folk and traditional fields. It has master apprenticeship that grants awards of uh, to, to traditional artists. Uh, it works on end of life. We've been now for six years, uh, had a partnership with the end of life coalition documenting um, multicultural expressions around death uh, and death directive and, and living trust, things like that. Multiple programs. And I still have a, a role on the board and as a sort of a lead folklorist there. Uh, I teach uh, when I when I get the opportunity. I'm, I teach it in the School of Anthropology. Usually, teach the entry level course called "Many Ways of Being Human." Have always enjoyed that and the interaction with students. I still carry on my own <laughs> project um, in Sonora in partnership with a Yaki Enterprise, growing heritage wheat, in trying to develop that enterprise within the Yaki uh, Vican community. We have a, a brand uh, that we're trying to develop through economic development and sort of documentation of wheat heritage practice. I, I do a little bit of that as my own research uh, agenda. And uh, now I'm serving since 2018 uh, in the college as Associate Dean for Community Engagement, which was um, the, the first time that someone occupies a role like that. And the job there um, 
holds the relationship with a lot of college uh, activities related to downtown lecture series, community classrooms for lifelong, lear lifelong learners. But I also play a, a critical role in the strategic planning of the college, the university. And now in the last year or so, spearheading the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts at the college as well. So that's an administrative uh, appointment. Uh, I would almost wanted to say a temporary appointment, meaning that it, it's I've been given a task to serve the college at that level. Uh, and once some of those things are set up, I could stay or not stay. It, it, it's, it's an administrative sort of call to duty in that sense. And that's mm -hmm. that's how I look at it. My my true identity is not a as a college administrator. My true identity is as a, a as a folklorist at the Southwest Center and as a, a contributing member of the teaching faculty at the School of Anthropology. Mm -hmm. I was thinking before this interview about, you know, just kind of trying to understand what it um, what it would mean to be a folklorist, somebody who who fo focuses on everyday life, you know, arts and you know, engagement around sort of uh, everyday life practices, and and then to be inside of an institution at the same time. And you know, you could look at that. Uh, one could look at that and think, well, maybe there's a tension there. Uh, right, because almost by definition, you could say, well, folk life happens outside of generally outside of formal channels. But I don't know, you know, is that a paradox that you have to hold or is that uh, I mean, I'm sure it's many things. So sorry about that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love that. I love that you bring this up. It, it's, it's one of the paradoxes, but it's also the where the rubber meets the road sort of spot of, <laughs> of how we have to think about the relevance of our work. One of the things I love about this field is that it happens. You don't need a folklorist or a grant uh, to organize, uh, you know, your carne asada in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call a folklorist before you order your meat. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to, to explain. My, my family has always reminded me that uh, there is a difference between the academic study of folklore traditions and the living practices. So the last thing they want is for me at the Thanksgiving dinner to say, well, this is an American ritual that uh, signifies, I mean, Come on, I just <laughs> cut the <Right>. turkey. <laughs> so there, there is a tension there because the feel of folklore as an academic field deals with the stuff of everyday life. In fact, one definition of folk life and folklore is heeding what others uh, do not pay attention to, <laughs> what mm -hmm. others neglect. And it's and that's a beautiful contradiction. We work right at the intersection and the interstitial spaces of that. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that that just gets me up in the morning every day. Mm. And uh, what what is uh, what is folklore? <laughs> Well, you, you know, in the all academic disciplines, it, it begins as a field of study that grows out of anthropology. All an early anthropologists were folklorists. In fact, huh. the, the American Folklore Society is founded in the late 1800s by Franz Boas. Mm -hmm. um, it, it refers specifically to expressive culture. And for a long time, it was only oral tradition. So the non-written cultures of storytelling and language, and therefore there were lore um, as part of the stories of the folk, the, the folk lore. In the 1940s, you begin to see the shift towards folk life, meaning that a, a more anthropological approach and not so much an English literary oral literature approach. Mm -hmm. um, and you begin to see folks organizing um, symposiums and festivals that celebrated uh, occupational cultures, mining culture, for example, fisheries uh, that began to look at architecture and vernacular architecture, by the way, an area where the South with Center also for many years did important contributions, uh, mm -hmm. Adobe construction, Adobe bricks, things of this nature. Uh, Would you begin to see the expansion after World War II of an interest in the full life of ethnic in, uh, enclaves and communities? Um, food waste uh, is always there. Folklorists introduced the word food waste um, to the lexicon. 
And it's not until until very recently with the so-called foodie implosion and the growing interest in, in foods that folklorists has sort of had a field day coming back to um, contribute to how much they knew actually about hams and why why would a particular kind of ham be called Virginia ham? <laughs> <laughs> and, and why would you call um, a, a particular form of tortilla in the Southwest, a name that is not, it's not universally known, but it is very meaningful in certain communities that could be derogatory even like sobaqueras, you know, mm -hmm. the, the large thin flour tortillas. What What's behind this sort of naming practices of things that live meaningful in, in the exchange of people's everyday life? So for Cloris, get inserted into this broadly categories of uh, sociology, anthropology, and cultural studies, history, philosophy, communications in, in interesting ways. But Jeff, sometimes through the back door, you know, mm -hmm. um, not always in, in the frontal driver's seat of the discipline, but more like, oh, we do this in anthropology. When I was a student in the 1990s at the University of Arizona, that was very true. Up front, we deal with political economy. Mm -hmm. On the side door or through the window, we look at expressive culture. Mm -hmm. So yes, there was room, but it wasn't the front room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you studied anthropology here at the University of Arizona. You have your uh, PhD from the what is now called the School of Anthropology. <laughs> That's um, right. It used to be the, I guess, the Department of Anthropology. Um, and that was the, what, the 90s, right? Late 80s, early 90s, the trajectory of your or yeah, the time early frame. Early 90s, right? I was here. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So um, obviously a different era in terms of its, you know, uh, intellectual concerns and the discipline at that moment. How do you think that your, um, you know, your training rooted in that moment influences your approach today as a folklorist oh wow um i i'm a through and through anthropologist and when i wrote my essay for graduate school i said you know i don't have an advanced degree yet in anthropology I, i'll have one if you accept me <laughs> but all my life i have been an impromptu anthropologist you know mm. I'm an immigrant in this country. My my parents were, were working class folks. My my dad' occupation was as a plumber, and then as a, a small business owner. I have always been an observer, a translator <laughs> of cultural difference, of understanding the human condition through things that affect us uh, beyond our control and then the things that we do to embellish and reestablish control to our expressive creativity. I, I wrote those things in my, in my application to mm. graduate school and they sound as, as true today to me as they did then in the early 90s, meaning um, we're all anthropologists in the sense that we're all always systematically observing analyzing and trying to understand, driven by this deep curiosity of what makes humans be human. And mm -hmm. that is the point of connection that I think I try to share with my students, with the volunteers at Tucson Meet Yourself, with other academics. Um, and that's, um, that's to me the exciting part. There are aspects of research and scholarship, of course, that, that have a, a role and a place in the Journal of American Folklore, for example, uh, amazing contributions there in terms of understanding how things become what they do. I remember teaching my students shortly after 9-11, an entire sort of section on humor and the appropriateness and inappropriateness of jokes after 9-11, mm -hmm. which uh, was a really tough subject to breach and, and the, the emergence of uh, memes on social media. Wow, all of a sudden we were dealing with current events, history, politics, religion, economic factors, and we were doing it through the lens of memes, humor, <laughs> vernacular sort of representations. And that was the point of connection that folklore is hidden in plain view in front of us all the time. Mm -hmm, mm 
Wow, what a beautiful re response to that question. I think your students are really lucky, the students in your, um, well, all of your students, but that the course you teach called uh, The Many Ways of Being Human, um, that sounds like a really fun class to teach. <laughs> well, and because folklore is such a democratic field where there's entry points, what happens, Jeff, is that then the students teach me, you know, mm -hmm. because they live their lives in folk communities as well, whether that's a sorority, a fraternity, or their own families, or their national origins, or they move here from another state, their, their family occupations. And so I become then a student with them of like, okay, well, tell me more about how your family does that. How, how does a Sri Lankan birthday celebration is different from a Polish birthday celebration. And then the class becomes a, a good lab for that type of intercultural sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the challenges I think is that many mainstream young Americans, they don't recognize themselves as having a culture. Mm -hmm. um, there is this sort of blandness, this effect of homogenizing American culture in such a way that sometimes, occasionally, you will ask a student, so tell me about a cultural tradition in your family. And they just stare back like, I don't know, we, we're, not a, we're not special. <laughs> we, mm -hmm. We're people with our culture. And my God, that's, that's a moment of saying, okay, well, let's examine that. Is that really true? Um, mm -hmm. And then we begin by the simple act of saying, does your family have a nickname for you? Oh, yeah. Um, I, my name is Joseph, but they call me Joey. Oh, well, well why, why? And so there begins the conversation. Oh, well, nicknames are part of folklore. And guess what? They're more than just nicknames. They are actually terms of endearment that represent family bonds of affection and legacy and history. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what you mean, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. I could imagine too that, you know, there's the sort of like uh, the ontology of being a, a so-called human <laughs> everyday life and, and being. Um, and then there's the, you know, the dimension of humanity that's brought into view by sort of dominant cultural processes so that that idea of the human has changed over time. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, we're kind of like in a constant sort of tension with that dominant ideal that's uh, motivated by popular culture and commerce and, and all of these other things. So it seems like it's such a, um, I don't know, that seems like a very vibrant area to explore with students because it, it's so personal. Well, as you can tell from when I talk about it, Jeff, it, it does take a, a, a bit of a, of an enthusiast <laughs> to, uh -huh. to carry on this work. And of course, even though, um, we moved on from talking about Jim Griffith um, and we're very different in our styles and in, in our affect, you know, Jim is, is a storyteller and, and forever will be right. And he'll rather, he would have answered each one of these questions you asked me with a story. Ah, uh, Yeah. <laughs> And no a, a very, a very deep uh, and illustrative story, by the way, some of his stories, um, you only catch the real meaning, like, three days later and you yes. go like, aha, okay, incredible wisdom. But we have the different style, yet both of us share that that just joyful curiosity and love for people. And that's what keeps us going, I think, in a discipline that has had some days, some really good days of recognition uh, in its heyday with Franz Boas and 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 many of the famous uh, um, uh, folklorists and anthropologists. And then some days that it has been relegated to the back of the room uh, as, oh, you guys are the ones who study baskets and tortillas. Well, good luck with that. Well, we've always been able to overcome those type of prejudice, whether, whether they are in the academy or in the philanthropic world, what have you, by demonstrating the, the impact and the endurance of these types of activities and artifacts as part of what holds us together as systems of, of resiliency and resistance, uh, systems of belonging, social cohesion. There's a language that we apply to all of those things that sometimes is actually the translation of value. And that 
sometimes it bothers me that I have to do that extra work. (laughs) (laughs) And then some other days I think, well, that's okay. That's quite all right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking in in my original question to you about having studied anthropology in the, you know, the eighties and nineties, it seems to me that that that's a moment in which ideas about political economy and, and big economic, socioeconomic structures. There's a lot of talk about that in that moment. Um, and yet, you know, we've since that time made a pretty big turn towards um, the everyday, you know, to, in, in, in many ways, the, the very thing that you are focused on. So that's, that's kind of why I was, why I was thinking about that, because it seems like we're in, you know, we're in such a different moment, yet, you know, those concerns from the 80s and 90s are still very much a part of, I think, what we're, um, what we're engaging with, uh, with here as well. Well, Jeff, you know, um, it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity that you've given me here to, to just um, talk about things I love and, and to create a space for, for sharing these stories. I think your questions today show a real generosity and grace, you know, in terms of, of the sincere desire to, to put things in perspective. And, and I, um, I so much appreciate you and, and the Southwest Center for this. Well, you're quite welcome. What would you say to a budding young folklorist, somebody who's interested in this um, in this work, you know, who's just getting into into this field at this moment? What would you say to them? You know the. The famous uh, African-American writer and folklorist, Zora Neale Hurston, Mm -hmm. uh, defined research as formalized curiosity. (laughs) I love that because curiosity is the number one driver of knowledge. It's also what brings you to a certain level of humility because you have to be curious means you have to acknowledge what you don't know and be willing to sit with that uh, discomfort a little bit enough so that then you try to hear things that you don't know. So for, for a young uh, folklorist, young anthropologist, I think that's, that is the muscle that needs training. The one that keeps you always curious and humble. The worst ways in which we can practice our professions. And you're a geographer. You also know about uh, entering people's spaces that they value in ways that are beyond what you can um, even apprehend at first, right? Or even after a long time, still. <laughs> or even after a long time. <laughs> uh, but the way people move through their through space, I, I will tell you that the worst forms of practice in our social science discipline in in our humanistic sciences are when we feel we got it down when we feel we got it we understand i had a, a young native american man that that i highly respect one day i was walking on campus and, and maybe this is our last story i'll tell you today I was walking on campus it had been shortly be, after i i was hired and he stopped and says, hey, Maribel, I, I'm so glad to know you're here. And um, I said, well, I, I have the job, you know, that Jim Griffith used to have at University of Oklahoma. And he looked at me very respectfully, very, very lovingly and said, you know what I don't like about folklorists? <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> tell me. Um, he says, I don't like that you always explain things as if they had only one meaning. Mm. Wow, man. Yes. <laughs> I that that moment stay with me all these years. Yes, this is what I understand, but that's not the only contained meaning. Because if you contain meaning, you're also containing humans' ability to innovate on that meaning, to interpret that meaning, mm-hmm. to tweak it, <laughs> mm-hmm. to adapt it. So I'm very grateful for his talk back to the anthropologist, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and that's the kind of relationships we want to foster where my intention is right. My heart is in the right place for to some meet yourself or for my work in, in, the, in, in, 
in the ancestral villages in Sonora of the Yaquis, I go with an open heart, but no, I don't know it all. I don't always get it right. And, and if I don't, I, I need to hear and be in partnership with you learning. So I was just going to say, what an important uh, memo to receive as you're be beginning your career. <laughs> right. I, I, I get lucky like that. Sometimes I'm walking <laughs> down the hallway and I find someone who just grabs my attention and sends me the lesson that the universe is uh, telegraphing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Message received. I'm hanging up the phone now. <laughs> well, Maribel, I think uh, that's probably a great place to stop. We're pretty much at time. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been so great uh, to talk to you. I have a huge respect for you as a colleague in the work that you do. And I know I'm definitely not alone in that. So, and, and also good luck with uh, Tucson Meet Yourself uh, next weekend. Thank you. And all I got to say is like, here's looking back at you, kid. <laughs> good one. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Thank Maribel. Thank you, Jeff. Thank so appreciate you. it. Yeah, have a good one. And uh, I'll probably see you. Uh...